All right, before we get started, let's address the elephant in the room. Uh, it's gonna be one of those videos. Alright, so tonight I'm drinking pineapple upside down cake Berliner with pineapple, cherry, vanilla, hazelnut, and milk sugar. It's kind of like a dessert beer. All right, so Mars and Venus are rimward and hubward neighbors according to the flat solar system theory. These two terrestrial planets are extremely different, but both have been featured in numerous articles talking about colonization, terraforming, and <laughs> extraterrestrial life. But how realistic and reliable are these claims? Well, to find out, let's first talk about the planets themselves. Despite being further away from the sun than Mercury, Venus actually has the highest peak and average temperature of any body in the solar system, peaking out at just over 460 degrees Celsius, which is insanely hot. That's hot enough to melt lead. And although its mass is comparable to the Earth's, it has 90 times as much atmospheric pressure as we do at the surface. On top of that, the winds in the atmosphere can reach hundreds of kilometers an hour, up to 700 kilometers an hour in some cases. This all combines to make a really extreme environment. Mars, by comparison, might seem relatively tame, but that doesn't mean it's free of its own problems. As I mentioned in another episode, Mars's dust is so fine that it will bog down even the most resilient of machines and is actually toxic when exposed to the oxygen-rich environments we depend on to live and breathe. Mars's gravity is also about one-third that of Earth's, which isn't too bad. It actually makes it easier for us to land and depart from the surface. But Mars's mass in total is about one-tenth of that of Earth, which <laughs> is going to be a problem as we're going to see later on in this episode. And finally, the temperature range on Mars is pretty extreme. It's down to negative 100 degrees Celsius during the uh, winter nights on Mars, but can go up to about 20 degrees Celsius, which is kind of livable as far as temperature is concerned uh, during the summer near the equator. And of course, the atmosphere on Mars isn't breathable and it's very, very low pressure. It's definitely not high enough pressure for humans to live on, even if it was composed of breathable oxygen nitrogen. Both planets lack any significant magnetic field, which will be a problem as we'll see in a minute. They both have CO2, carbon dioxide rich atmospheres, which is both a blessing and a curse. And they're both gonna be really extreme challenges when it comes to colonizing and terraforming in different ways. But what does it even mean to colonize a planet? How many people do you need to make a planet colonized instead of just temporarily inhabited? Ecologically, colonizing is defined as the action by a plant or animal of establishing itself in an area. But what does it mean to establish oneself? Well, when we talk about colonizing another planet, we can consider establishing oneself as meaning having a permanent settlement on that planet. Enough resources to keep yourselves alive, to maintain your habitats and your equipment without depending on another planet or another civilization such as Earth. All right, so obviously we need food and we need water and we need air. And all these things are very much available to us on Mars in kind of a first order approximation. We could notionally grow what we need using Martian soil. We could harvest water from the polar ice caps and we can use that water to create breathable air. But that's only the basics of what we need. In order to establish a colony, a real Martian colony, we would need a lot more than that. We'd need mines, we'd need warehouses, we'd need manufacturing facilities, chemical processing facilities, laboratories, schools, habitats, entertainment complexes, distribution and logistics, and a lot of power to feed the entire system. A lot more than they could be provided by a few solar panels. Now, much of our manufacturing challenges could be accomplished with some kind of additive or subtractive manufacturing, basically 3D printing. But even so, the amount of supplies you would need to actually get that started is hundreds of tons of delivery capability to the Martian surface, which is something that we just don't have access to right now. Even considering Starship, it would require dozens of flights just to get the foundations for a basic Martian colony. And although Elon Musk has a very aggressive timeline for this, Realistically and conservatively, we're talking decades to establish the first human colony on Mars. Okay, so what about Venus? Well, this gets a little bit tricky. Venus is hot. I mean, really hot. And we don't have the kind of technology required to keep 
a human habitat cool enough on the surface of Venus. So one thing we could do is use a heat pump, which is just a fancy word for something that takes heat from one place and puts it into another, something like your refrigerator. In space, we use things called radiators, which are big fans that stick out from the side of the spacecraft facing perpendicular to the sun that radiate away the heat energy of the spacecraft into space. It can do this because the surface area of the radiators is greater than the surface area with which it is in contact on the spacecraft. It wouldn't work this way on Venus. But what about refrigeration? I mean, we keep things cool all the time in our fridge, right? Well, refrigerators rely on evaporation to keep things cool. It's kind of like when you get out of a swimming pool, suddenly you're really cold. Well, that's because the water on your skin is evaporating and taking your body heat with it. It's the same thing with a fridge, except it's a different chemical and it's pumped inside your fridge through a tube, which then evaporates, taking the heat energy from the things inside of your refrigerator with it. That evaporated gas now makes its way outside of your fridge, where it's pumped into a different series of tubes, radiating away the heat that it gained from inside your fridge out into the surrounding environment. Well, can we do something like that for Venus? Can people live inside a fridge? Well, the short answer is kind of no. And it's not because fridges don't work, obviously. They do, they work quite well. But we don't have the materials, the actual solid materials. We need to make something like that work on Venus because everything is too hot. Remember, it melts lead and it would definitely melt the refrigerator, which used to be lined with lead. But there may be other ways to keep things cold on Venus. And it comes down to a question of relative temperatures. A fellow NASA scientist has developed a way of using Stirling engines, basically rudimentary heat transfer mechanisms that use the process of evaporating and condensing gas to transfer heat from one place to another, basically using that energy. A clever configuration of these Stirling engines might be enough to keep a spacecraft or rover cool enough to survive Venus. What is cool enough, you might ask? About 200 degrees centigrade, well over the boiling temperature of water and definitely too hot for people to survive, but cool enough for electronics to survive. And that might be an important first step in understanding what the surface of Venus is like. Basically the amount of energy for a human colony on the surface of Venus is just too much. It's just too hot to live on, but there might be a way in the foreseeable future for someone to visit Venus and stay there in relative comfort. Floating cities. Well, the temperature and pressure in the upper atmosphere of Venus really isn't too bad. And in fact, about 60 or 70 kilometers away from the surface, it actually comes to a nice, comfortable temperature and pressure, something we could actually live at. Another bonus is, of course, that the atmosphere is made out of CO2, which is actually quite heavy. So our floating cities filled with oxygen and nitrogen would be relatively light compared to the surrounding atmosphere and would provide a certain amount of buoyancy. Probably not enough to keep the floating city up by itself, so you're looking at spending more hydrogen or helium to keep it floating, much like a dirigible. However, this wouldn't quite constitute colonization by itself. It might be enough to collect water from the atmosphere and provide us with a place to live and breathe, but it wouldn't be enough to keep us fed. How do you grow food in the upper atmosphere? You would need an army of robotic workers down on the surface, mining, manufacturing, collecting, and sending the supplies up to the human overlords in the sky. All of these robots would need maintenance and you need other robots to maintain those robots. So you would be creating an entire robot civilization on the surface. Kind of weird to think about. But of course, food is still an issue. You can't grow food on the surface because we can't keep it cold enough. So you'd need to grow it up there on the sky, which means larger floating habitats, which means larger infrastructure, which means more robots on the surface. And you can see how this starts to snowball. It is definitely not an easy prospect. Okay, so let's say that the colonization of Venus is just as absurd as I described it to be. And colonization of Mars is just gonna take too long. What about terraforming those planets to make it more livable for us? All right, so what does it take to terraform Mars? Well, it's just a matter of 
nuking the poles, right? Hmm, maybe not. So terraform Mars would require three key things. One, a denser atmosphere made up of primarily nitrogen and oxygen. Two, a more stable and higher surface temperature, something that we could live on. And three, an abundance of liquid water on the surface. Now the theory used to be that there was a planet-wide layer of permafrost that if you were able to melt would produce enough liquid water to restore Mars to its glory days several billion years ago. Unfortunately, it's not that simple and nuking the poles would not provide enough water to make Mars even close to being habitable. You see, like all planets in our solar system, Mars is bombarded constantly with the solar wind. And the strength of that solar wind depends on how close you are to the sun by a factor of one over the distance squared. Mars is about 1.5 AUs from the sun, or one and a half times the distance of the Earth. Venus is about 0.7 and Jupiter about 5.2. Now we mentioned that nitrogen and oxygen are both lighter than CO2 and thus more likely to be carried away by the solar wind both from Venus and from Mars. How is this possible? Mars is one and a half times as far away from the Earth, but yet isn't able to hold around these particles that Earth itself can easily hold on to? Well, remember how we mentioned that Mars' mass would be a little bit of a problem? Well, this is why. It's one-tenth the mass of Earth, and thus more susceptible to being bombarded by the solar wind and having these lighter particles carried away over time. Venus, although comparable to Earth in size, doesn't have the same magnetic field that we enjoy here, and thus is more susceptible to exposure to the solar wind. And of course, it's closer to the sun anyway. So even if we were able to dump a tremendous amount of material onto Mars for its atmosphere, it would still get blown away anyway. And recent findings by the MAVEN spacecraft show that that rate of loss is actually faster than we were originally expecting. And that goes for water vapor too. In fact, that's how scientists think that Mars's oceans have been lost over time. They were evaporated, turned into water vapor, and were carried away by the solar wind because they were lighter than CO2. But that unlocks a little bit of a mystery. You see, we don't know how Mars was able to collect that much water and keep it in the first place. How did it have liquid water on its surface long enough to have all of the surface changes we see, all of this erosion and these canyons and these obvious signs of flowing water on the surface? Well, there are many possible options. One is that the sun used to be dimmer long, long ago, several billion years ago. But this conflicts with other possible findings. If the sun was dimmer, Mars wouldn't have been warm enough to have liquid water on the surface. So if our sun wasn't dimmer in the past, then what could have provided enough energy to Mars to have liquid water on the surface, but not have had enough susceptibility to the solar wind to have it blown away rather quickly? Well, another possibility is that Mars has migrated in its orbit. Recent findings and simulations on solar system development suggest that planets could move around quite a bit over time in their orbits. In fact, there might have been another gas giant in between us and Jupiter, and it has now been flung completely out of the solar system. Perhaps Mars had a denser atmosphere, I mean, a lot denser, that kept a lot of this heat inside the planet long enough for these surface water erosion activities to take place. Another option is that Mars was geologically active. In fact, we know this by looking at the planet that Mars once long ago had a lot of active volcanoes on its surface, Olympus Mons being the largest volcano in the solar system. So maybe this heating from inside the planet was enough at one time to keep liquid water present on the surface for a long period of time. Well, to find out which one of these things it really was, we're going to have to visit the red planet and find out for ourselves. But let's go back to terraforming. Regardless of Mars's past, what would it take to revive that lost legacy, to put water on the surface once again and make a denser atmosphere? Melting the ice caps would only generate about one seventh of the water that Mars had in the past. So we're gonna need to generate a lot more water, find out another resource to draw from to give Mars the water it needs to become habitable once again. And one possibility is all of the icy bodies within the solar system, all of these comets and maybe Ceres itself. We could redirect those planetoids and asteroids to collide with Mars and dump that water onto the surface. This would also help contribute to the warming of the planet and generate a lot of dust output to kind of create a temporary greenhouse effect on the planet. Now that sounds great, but the amount of energy you would need, the amount of thrust you would need to move these objects and redirect their course 
is astronomical, literally astronomical. It's not something we have access to now or even in the foreseeable future. Even dumping a tremendous amount of nukes onto these planets or asteroids would probably not redirect them in the way we think that we need to. And besides, we're talking about thousands upon thousands of asteroids with varying inclinations and orbits, and it would be a truly gargantuan undertaking to do this. But theoretically, if you had an infinite amount of thrust, maybe it's something you could pull off. All right, so what about Venus? Well, like Mars, you need to do three key things. One, reduce the temperature. Two, change the consistency of the atmosphere. And three, collect enough water to have liquid water on the surface because unlike Mars, there are no polar ice caps. There are other things that might be a problem too. As we mentioned, the atmospheric density on the surface of Venus is about 90 times that as it is on the surface of Earth at sea level. Plus the radiation being that close to the sun compared to Earth might be a real problem, especially without any real magnetosphere. But we're gonna ignore those problems. It's known that humans can live in relatively high atmospheric pressure, and we're gonna assume that that dense atmosphere might keep out a majority of the radiation. Overall, these are problems with human physiology that might be worth talking about another time. Unlike Mars, Venus's gravity might be enough to keep around these particles for a little bit longer, more than just a couple of thousands of years. The bad news is that water only accounts for about 20 parts per million, in its atmosphere, compare that to Mars, where it's several hundred parts per million. The good news is that there is a lot of atmosphere, so maybe you could extract a decent amount of water from that atmosphere if you really tried. However, another problem is that Venus has very little nitrogen. Very, very little nitrogen. We're talking about 3%, compare that to Earth's 70%. So you're gonna have to deliver enough nitrogen to Venus so that it's not only breathable for us, but also breathable for plants as well, which require nitrogen content in the air to grow and to live. Now, icy bodies scattered throughout the solar system have an abundance of nitrogen ice or ammonia ice that we could use to bombard the planet and deliver some of that oxygen and nitrogen to the surface required to have liquid water and a nitrogen oxygen atmosphere. Overall, the problem with Venus is much the same as the problem with Mars. Where are you gonna get all the water ice, all of the nitrogen you need to populate these planets and create a reasonable biosphere? And even if you figure out where to get all of that, there's the question of the amount of energy in Delta V you need to redirect these objects, the temperature changes you're going to need to induce on both planets, and of course, the expense required to carry out these operations to begin with. And then finally, there's the question of, should we even do it to begin with? Before we go any further, let's set something straight. The news you get for free online is free because they make money from advertising. And in order to do that, they need those sensationalist headlines to draw in as many people to make as much money as they can from advertising to make their shareholders happy. So free media outlets tend to bend the truth a little bit. So sensational headlines might not be what they seem. Now this may seem like a tangent, but one of those sensational headlines recently was is there life on Venus? Uh, take these news outlets with a grain of salt or better yet, find a news outlet that doesn't depend on advertising revenue. Maybe even pay for one yourself, something like National Geographic, Nature, or Science Magazines. These are all really great sources. They don't use sensationalist headlines, at least not nearly to the same degree as you get off of something like space.com, which has been frustratingly sensationalist recently. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and suspicious amounts of certain chemicals in the atmosphere, whether it be geysers from Europa or Enceladus, maybe a strange shaped rock formation from a Martian rock we found in Antarctica, or phosphine gas from Venus, all require more than just a little bit of a hunch to say that there are life on these worlds. In short, Occam's razor, the simplest answer is probably the one that's correct. And in this case, there's a chemical process we didn't expect on the surface, and it's probably not life. That isn't to say that life couldn't or doesn't exist. It's just simply stating that we don't know. And jumping to conclusions is 
counterproductive both for scientists and for the general public, which think that, oh, scientists were wrong. They told us there was life on Venus. Well, no, we didn't say that. We have been hypothesizing about life beyond the solar system for as long as we found other bodies to look at, uh, Mars and Venus and all these places. We've always thought that maybe there were life on all these other planets. And indeed, we know that life can survive in really extreme environments. Even here on Earth, where we thought there was no possible way life could exist, we have found life. We found extremophiles clinging to the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the sea where we thought it was too toxic for any life to exist. However, even now we still haven't discovered any life definitively beyond our own planet, except for the tardigrades we sent to the moon. Shh, don't tell anyone. Unexpected astronomical observations almost always have a simpler answer. Now that brings us to our next point. Should we even try to terraform these worlds? A planet is a big place, and even on our own planet, where we have lived for almost 200,000 years, we're still discovering new forms of life almost every month. So how do we know for sure there is no life on Venus or Mars? What right do we have to colonize these worlds or terraform these worlds and wipe out this life that might exist? Is it our moral obligation to scour these planets for life before we try any form of terraforming? For that matter, should we even visit them? Should we risk the chance of contaminating them with our own filthy earthborn bacteria, also known as forward contamination? How can we be certain that we're not going to destroy life as quickly as we are going to create it? What level of certainty is appropriate? 1% chance of life? 0.1% chance of life? One in one million chance of life? These are all questions that we're still trying to answer today and something that we'll be struggling with for many years to come. We do have some preliminary estimates. The planetary protection program set forth by NASA gives us a baseline for estimating what kind of risk we're looking at for forward or back contamination. Even so, it's an unanswered question. What do you think is an acceptable criteria for colonization or terraformation? Should we even try to terraform a planet? Maybe this is something our great great grandchildren will be laughing over, that we even struggle with such an idea. Just like we laugh at the idea that our great great grandparents thought that there was a chance that humans would go crazy on top of those newfangled steam locomotives because they simply go too fast. Perhaps one day we will settle on an obvious solution that we have yet to see right before our eyes. Until next time, cheers. Thanks for watching.